And this isn't something Ness messes up with. It's, 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 usually, a, it's usually a, a guy problem. <laughs> but anyway, when we hear our wives or, or whoever uh, say something, oftentimes we, we think of the opposite. So if uh, she says fine, what she really what the, the what she's really saying is the opposite of fine. <laughs> Discussion's over. <laughs> if, if if you and I'm sure you've probably heard this before, do whatever you want. <laughs> this is really a test. You should know enough about me by now that if you do this, you're in the doghouse. And I'm sure, in fact, I have almost heard this this morning. I'm almost ready. We've all heard that. What, what, the, what the translation is, what they're really saying is, I'll be ready when I'm ready. Could be 10 minutes or it could be an hour. Just find something else to do. I, I'm sure we've probably done this before. We need to talk. That means I need to talk and you shut up. <laughs> Anyway, we got one more here. It says, we'll talk about this later. I've heard this before, too. We'll talk about this later. What they're really saying is, I'm so furious with you that I can't think straight. I need more time to gather ammunition to get back at you. Okay, anyway, those are just some things that we guys have to kind of we sometimes take the wrong way. Um, I want to welcome everybody this morning. Uh, do we have any guests? that someone wants to introduce. Uh, the announcements we got here this morning, uh, today we have uh, children's church uh, and at 1030 Sunday school for all ages. Uh, this week we got the uh, newsletter articles that are supposed to be uh, submitted uh, by uh, noon tomorrow. And uh, Tuesday at 6.30 is a church board meeting and Wednesday night, the youth um, have, a, have a, a gathering. And then at, at 6.30, the adult Bible study. I don't know if anybody has any more additional announcements they can come up. Uh, some reminders is uh, the October council meeting has been rescheduled to uh, for October 8th. And uh, you can check the bullet for, for details. Uh, we still need some Sunday school teachers. Uh, contact uh, Julie or Janet, uh, Nadine, or Heather Steffen uh, if anyone's interested, and then see at the bulletin for further instructions. Morning. Um, we are in search of another person to help Angie on Awana uh, to be like her assistant. Uh, she's not going anywhere anytime soon on that job, but. Um, her and I, we've been having some talks about it. Um, she would like to have an assistant, so that way, uh, when it is her time, she decides she does not want to be part of that anymore. The assistant can then take over. Um, so if you are interested in that, um, it'd be nice if maybe somebody was already involved with really Iwana would do it, unless somebody that's not involved with Iwana would love to do it. Um, just see me. Uh, hopefully we'll keep the announcement in the bulletin for a while. Um, but if you, uh, if you have any thoughts on that, just see me, and we can talk about it, I can let you know what it involves, um, but if you are interested, just see me, thanks. We will continue to, we will continue to worship as we listen to the prelude.
heads for prayer. Uh, mighty God, everything you do reveals your glory and majesty. Open our eyes to see what you are doing in our lives. Let us marvel at your good gifts and your wise provision. Your acts are amazing. We cannot comprehend the number of blessings you pour out on us from day to day. As we gather today, we pray that we will fill our hearts and our minds and our souls through Jesus Christ. Amen. We can stand right now for a uh, hymn. If you're using your hymnal, turn to 519, Great is Thy Faithful.
This morning we have a uh, children's story by C.J. Drake, and the kids can come forward, and he wants them to sit in the front pew because he's going to be talking to them from up here. So the kids can uh, come forward at this time. Today we are going to be talking, today we are going to learn about how God helps us through difficult times. Bad stuff even happens to Christians, but God will never leave you alone when you suffer. I know this because 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except, except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Let's demonstrate this. Okay, so let's say you are this balloon. May I have an adult volunteer to help me blow this up and tie it off? Thank you. That big enough? Yeah, that's big enough. Thank you. So this is a see-through balloon, as you see. Now, let's say this needle is a sin or a temptation that is that has been going through you in your life. What would happen if we would put the needle through the balloon? Yes. Yes, it will pop. But I know a way that we can keep ourselves from being popped from bad temptations. When you face something bad, you need to be covered by a prayer. Let me say a quick prayer. Please, God, just do not let this balloon pop. God will send the Holy Spirit to cover you and protect you in the bad times. Watch this. See? God's protection didn't let the balloon pop. No. Good job. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> I can't even pull it down on the yard. But if you do not ask God for help, <laughs> You'll pop. Oh. You see, if God, you see, if God allows bad stuff to happen to us, He protects us so that it ends up doing, he, so it ends up doing His work in our lives. Now, sometimes God, God allows bad stuff to, bad stuff and temptations to happen to you, but He provides grace and strength for going through those times. Sometimes during those situations, you might feel like this, like the balloon is about to burst. But you need to remember that God is with you during those times. Pray, co pray covering, and he will help you get through. Let us pray. Dear God, uh, thank you for this good day of church, and please let all these kids who are sitting up here watching, just please let them have a good time through their life, and try not to let them be tempted by the devil, and just let them have a good life. In your name, amen. Thanks, Curtis. That was pretty good. I'm still trying to figure out how you did that. <laughs>
of the kids, uh, kids can go, uh, our teens have to go to their children's church. And uh, please stand as we have uh, another hymn. she's done that and I'm so thankful um, you know I, I didn't really have a clue I think when we were married 15 years I uh, said something uh, I think we went away for our 15th anniversary and I got some flowers I said for 15 good years and she said they weren't all good and, and she was serious uh, it was, wasn't a hit Randy <laughs> it was the truth uh, so, I'm, so I'm glad that she uh, did put up with me that's for sure um, the, this seems like our church family's had a lot of loss of life. Uh, we want to pray for the Beachy and Miller families, their loss of Louis. Uh, Louis is Merv's brother, was Merv's brother-in-law. Uh, we want to pray for the Fudge, Kaufman, Dietrich, and Drake families and their loss of Randy. He passed away unexpectedly Thursday. It was Evelyn's brother-in-law. And I think Randy was and his wife were missionaries. Uh, many of you know them, I think. Then uh, our sister-in-law, Tina, lost her husband, or I'm sorry, her father, uh, Burl. And um, so it seems like our family's been getting hit some too. He was at the doctor, and the doctor said, you are fine, and he died getting in the car. So you just never know. <laughs> and you just better be ready, as we talked about. Um, Nancy told me this morning that her sister, Kay, is not doing well at all. And she needs to go back to the hospital, and Kay's husband just can't take care of her anymore. So they're trying to find assisted living, and they're not being very successful. Um, it's not, not many openings is what they're finding. Um, we've been praying for Chloe, a friend of the Griffith family, 
And here's an update. She needs to be closely monitored with scans. She will not need chemo and radiation, but there's a possibility that the tumor was secondary cancer and not a recurrence. So we'll just continue praying for that. For those of you who prayed for my sister, she does not have to have additional surgery. That would have been a mastectomy. Uh, she, and she was prepared for that, but um, she doesn't have to have surgery. I think she said four weeks of rest, and then she'll have to have some radiation. Um, Brett uh, expressed um, a concern for his family. Um, Bryce and Allie and Colt, I think I have the names right, uh, were in a car accident when a semi um, hit them, and that's never good, semi versus car, as you know. Uh, but uh, Bryce was hurt the worst. Uh, he had uh, broken some, had some bones broken, and uh, he went home, but he had surgery then, and uh, hopefully he's on the mend. Uh, Allie had a lot of bumps and bruises, but praise God, that seems to be all for her. And those car seats, if we could put those little ones in, are amazing. Colt had nothing wrong at all. So we're thankful, and we, you know, we just never know when we go out on the road. Um, you know, we get concerned about different things, and, and as, as well we should, but just simple things that we take for granted that we can do can end up coming back to uh, give us trouble. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to worship. And we thank you for the music we have in worship. Sometimes we can almost take that for granted. You know, sometimes we have a worship team leading us. Sometimes we sing with piano and organ and a chorister. And it's pretty amazing what you've allowed our voices and instruments to do. And just want to thank you for the music again this morning. Uh, one of the perks of working here is to hear uh, practice going on. So I heard these beautiful songs several times this week, and I thought, wow, they are so pretty and so beautiful. And we thank all those, whether they're choristers or pianists or organists or uh, part of the worship team, you know, just help us. I know we can get caught up that maybe music's too much, but music is certainly part of worship. And uh, I, I thank you and praise you, God, for the balance that you've given to, to this congregation. Uh, Lord, you know how we hate to lose our loved ones, but we just thank you when our loved ones are ready to meet you. But we just uh, lift up the, the Beachy and Miller families this week, and the Fudge, Kaufman, Neetrauer, Drake family, and Henry Thompson, Godfrey families. And Lord, uh, that's just people that we know of. And every day there's many obituaries and there's many people going through times of loss and not all of those people are saved. So we just pray and ask that you would comfort the people that are left behind, the families that are left behind. Uh, just be with Kay. I know Nancy's far away from Kay and she would love to be closer and be able to help out, but it's just not possible where they live. Uh, so we just pray that, that uh, you would be with Kay and, and uh, that she would be able to, to handle what's going on in her life a little bit better. But when we have dementia and that types of things, you know, our, our thinking changes so it, we can become quite different than what we were before. Lord, we ask you to be with Chloe as uh, she has a lot going on. She's a young gal and, and hopefully she can keep a positive uh, look outlook on this. And thank you, Lord, for being uh, watching over the Whiteheads in uh, uh, an accident that could have been lots and lots of tragedy. Not the broken bones and the destroyed car and things like that aren't, aren't tragedies. They are. But they can be replaced. Uh, but we're thankful for the lives that you saved through that. Uh, Lord, we pray for uh, the Church of Brethren. We pray for uh, the Covenant Brethren Church as they meet for... Uh, and their first annual meeting next week and 
and uh, Lord, there's a lot of lot of things going on right now, and just help us uh, be aware and and uh, know and show us how you would have us uh, react. Um, we pray for our church leaders. We also pray for our leaders of the country, and we know that um, uh, voting is coming up here, uh, vote, voter day, you know, pretty pretty quickly. And Lord, you know how this is all going to turn out. And help us no matter what the outcome uh, instead of help us not get angry or that type of thing but just to know that you've got this you've got it under control we you don't need our help I know we think you do but you don't need our help at all and uh, everything is happening for a reason and the ultimate reason is as we're told in Romans 28 for your honor and glory so help us remember that. And, and to understand that a bad thing, when bad things happen, you can still make it for your good. Lord, we pray for those who are in the military, whether they be at home or away right now. Uh, for the policemen, Lord, just be with all their families, the first responders, uh, you know, all those who, who are running toward the tragedy when the rest of us are moving away. Um, and Lord, we know that we can never include everyone's prayer. Uh, some people will choose not to share, and that's fine too, but they have uh, private unspoken requests. So hear us as we lift those up. Lord, there were more joys than just our anniversary, but I thank you for my wife for the 45 years you've given us and the four great sons and three daughter-in-laws and 10 grandchildren. We just uh, love them and don't get to spend enough time with them. So we're glad that we can spend all, just missing one son this week, but uh, have everyone else. And Lord, uh, I'm not sure I publicly thank everyone who helped us move. And people were saying, are you getting used to it? Well, I found myself walking toward the car seat the other day. It's the oddest thing. It's the longest place that we've called home in our, uh, in our marriage and family. Uh, so it's almost with sadness I look at when it's dark in the evening and when I leave and think, wow, all the life that was happening there and that quick, it's all moved. So uh, a yes to those who said, are you finding stuff that, that uh, you didn't know you had? Yes. Have we not found stuff we know we had? Yes. <laughs> so, uh, but we're, we're still looking and, and we just thank you again, Lord, for all the help that we've had doing that. So Lord, uh, as we continue on in, in this worship service, may your name be lifted up. And as we look uh, look at guys, uh, I hope that, that we'll all pay attention, even though when we have for guys message and for gals, both can learn. So I hope that both will listen in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for the reading of God's Word. The book of Ephesians, chapter 5, starting with verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the Word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. The word of God. Thank you, Teresa. 
Okay, ladies, last time we talked about submission and your role in that, but never fear, this is the guy's turn, uh, to look at what our family role is and, and what our submission responsibilities are. And you might like it that there's three times as many verses for guys as there is for gals. Let's pray. Lord, may the meditations of my heart and everything that I think and say be found acceptable in your sight. If it's not, Lord, you have the ability to stop before it gets out. And I count on you to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's very easy, gentlemen, to focus so much on what we think our wife should be doing for us that we forget our own role. So let's take Ephesians 5.25 apart just a little bit. It says, husbands love your wives. Okay, picture of my wife coming up here. Some people ask me who that is, by the way, and I tell them it's my first wife. Now that's the truth, right? So I shouldn't get in trouble. But don't you think it'd be easy to love her? I mean, she's so pretty. She's so beautiful. But you know, there's more than one kind of love, isn't there? There is three loves, um, and there they are, eros, and phileo, and agape. You see, if, if I'm going to marry Nancy for her looks, what's going to happen when the looks aren't quite like they were? What's going to happen for me when I don't look quite like I did? So, so it's a, a little more going on here than just the eros love. Okay, so then we're told in the next part, just as Christ loved the church. Wow. Now that's getting a little, little deeper there. We know that, that Christ loved the church a lot. Again, three kinds of love. You know, I found that the one person says there's four. There's a family love, too, that they put in before phileo. So just to know that, that that's out there, I don't know if it's exactly right or not. But the phileo of love is more like a brother-sister love, that we care for each other. Okay, not, you're not ready to marry everybody you meet your friends with, uh, but we have a, a love with them, too. And then the next part kind of gets kind of scary. It says that, that Christ gave his self up for her, the church. And that that doesn't sound so simple, does it? And it almost sounds overwhelming. And, and, and then we have to think, well, how much love is that? Well, that's where it took him. It took him to the cross. And that is the agape love that we are asked to have for each other. So, ladies, I will admit at first glance, submitting to male headship seems to belittle you. But always remember, ladies, that Christian headship is different from the world's. Christian headship is about submission and love. Number one, Jesus' headship expresses care over control. Okay, rather than control Nancy, I'm going to express care. And if I'm doing something that's hurting her, uh, I'm, I'm going to back that off. Care is over that. And responsibility over demands. You know, I can make all kinds of demands and probably often do um, to my discredit. Um, but, you know, I, I should care more about my responsibility to make her feel loved and accepted in our marriage. And then uh, healthy spirit-led uh, relationships are not concerned with power or control. You hear that? Hear that? We are not in this to decide who has the power. And guys, you know that when we are somewhere and we need to leave and we have to say, we say that, well, you know, my wife's accepted. Expect me home. What are we told? Oh, I can see who the boss is in your family. You know? And, and we make it worse for one another. Like, uh, what's she going to do if you don't go back? You know? 
And instead of saying, hey, God bless you, good, you're doing what you should be doing, we try to make it worse on each other sometimes. Okay. Um, when you think about submitting, and when you think about the command to love as Jesus does, that's not an easy thing either. How can you and I love our wives as Jesus loved his wife, the church? Very difficult. But never forget, gals with submission, you have a helper. You have a helper to help you learn to submit. And guys, we have a helper to help us love like Jesus Christ. And of course, that helper is the Holy Spirit. Number two, how do we love our wives with agape love? Well, we look to Christ. Christ loves the church sacrificially, compassionately, gently, and lovingly. All right, the sacrifice is possibly the easiest, the hardest to do maybe, but the easiest love to see. When Christ gave his life for the church, men, we are called to give ourselves unreservedly to our wives and children. And that can be a sacrifice. You might rather stay out and play, bowl another game or go out for another time of fishing, but we say no, it's time to be home. Now, now what we need to understand here is that compassionately, we say, well, love and compassion are the same thing. Not necessarily. If, if I go out the door and Nancy says, I love you, and I say, ditto, or she says something else, and I say, yeah, back at you. She wants to hear, I love you. She wants to hear the compassion in my, my voice. You know, I tell you when I do wrong, so this time I think the Lord re reminded me of something good. On our anniversary, he said, type wad, call the florist. And I did. And I got her flowers. And she loved that. And, and she felt if I would have just said, well, she said, I didn't get you anything. For, I don't know how many years of our marriage, she's been getting me stuff and not getting anything in return. So I, I, I felt guilty. I said, don't get me anything. So this time the, the tables were turned, but she loved that. And that was a way of showing compassion. Gently, we can love in a rough way. Uh, sometimes we, maybe with our children, we throw them around, wrestle them and carry them on. Um, our wife would always say, you don't know how strong you are. And, and what you're doing hurts. So, so we need to love gently. And then uh, we need to love, I can't read my own writing. What was that last one? Uh, lovingly, lovingly, love lovingly. Um, you know, again, let, have you ever told your wife you cherish her? That, that's what I think, you know, use loving talk. Let me talk. Uh, well, I see you got the wash done for once. Isn't going to cut it. <laughs> uh, but wow, you you did all that today and, and, and got that done. And, and you still had time to make your supper and, and things like that. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about love lovingly. Now, guys, these are not suggestions. Okay. These are commands. And you might say, well, I thought all the commands were in the Ten Commandments. Well, you might wish so, but that is not it. There are many scriptures that are given as commands. Um, you know, all the, the Ten Commandments were given to Mount Sinai. We think that Jesus taught Paul on Mount Sinai. But what they have in the Bible are still scriptural commands. We're not going to look it up, but I want to give you an, an idea. We're told to pray without ceasing. That's a command. We are told to resist the devil. That is a command. We are commanded to forgive one another. And we are commanded to flee from temptation. Number three. Guys, agape, that means love. God's love. Agape your wives anytime 
we are less than loving. Remember God's command to love her. You know, did you ever have one of those fights and you go down the road and think, oh man, that wasn't very smart. Wish I wouldn't have done it that way. You know, sometimes we don't get a chance to make it right. A lot of times we do. But there are some people that are separated in that way eternally because of an accident or a health act or anything like that. We, and I, I try to teach this in, in pre-marriage classes, we all have the idea that wife, Miss, Missy, whatever her name is, Nancy, you cannot do anything that would make me not love you. What can separate us from the love of God? What, what do they say? What's the Bible say? Nothing. nothing. And that's how it should be with our wives. There is nothing. It doesn't matter if we think, if I think Nancy deserves love or not. That's not what it's about. It's about that we are commanded to love. I don't know if this is kind of a little bit of, of uh, tidbits or, you know, I just thought it was interesting. Number four, do you realize that men are commanded to love our wives? And guess what, gentlemen? However, the wife is not commanded to love her husband. Now, you might say, that stinks. Does that mean she's just free to take off and she's just free as a bird to do whatever she wants? She can leave us and it doesn't matter? No. Well, you know what it really shows and what it means? That if we love our wives the way Christ loves us and his church, the makeup of a woman is such that we will never have to worry about her running away from that love. What do women run away from? Sometimes abuse, a lot of times verbal abuse, a lot of times not being appreciated, okay? But if we love like Christ loves, she will automatically love us and no one will have to tell her how to show love to us. All right. In, in verse 25, kind of summary, summarizing it up. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church, and he gave himself up for her. Now, why did he do that? Why? Because now the Holy Spirit is going to turn to the husband's spiritual role. So, guys, we have a physical role. We have a spiritual role. In the care and the maintenance of the home, and this would be believing homes, folks. It's not going to be this way lots of times in unbelieving homes. So what we're trying to do in, in uh, 26, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. Oh, man, we're supposed to make our wives holy? How in the world can I make anybody holy? I can't. You can't, but we can introduce you to the one who can declare that we are holy. Now, if you do any looking at Jewish literature, Jewish, uh, the Jewish Bible parts, cleansing was such an important part of their worship. Washing rituals, they had everything like that. Then John the Baptist comes along and says, here's the cleansing you need, water baptism. But now, as we go to God's word in this church age, we are talking about being cleansed by scripture. You ever think about that? That you're cleaning up your life when you read your devotions? I believe this is telling us, because it says to make her holy. Guys, I think this is telling us that we are the home Bible study leader. All right? Now, that doesn't mean that we don't exclude our wives and children. You might let them lead sometimes, too. But we, the buck stops with us, gentlemen. 
And, and I challenge everyone that's becoming a new member to get into personal study now, and then when you have your family, have family study. We didn't have that because of this contrary dunker. But praise God, Nancy taught the boys, and they knew maybe more about the Bible than I did. So, going through this world that we live in is going to dull our conscience. You know, when, when we, at the butcher shop, when we were skinning and stuff, if you hit teeth, like if you're skinning in a head, and I don't want to gross anybody out, maybe, but anyhow, teeth, cattle teeth, hog teeth, that takes the edge right off the knife. You may as well just quit using that knife for the day until you sharpen it again. Okay? So, we go through all this junk in life, and it dulls our spiritual life. It dulls our conscience. After a while, we find ourselves thinking that something that we thought was pretty bad isn't quite as bad as we thought anymore. But it is. And we need to be sharpened, and we're sharpened by being washed by the Word of God. Number five. Now you might say, hey, we're already forgiven. We're already forgiven. But in this whole world, we're going to occasionally be defiled by sin. Look at David, a man after God's own heart. And my goodness, what a family like he had. It was terrible. Uh, King Saul, some of the things he did, you know. Uh, so we're going to be defiled. So I don't know why my eyes aren't focusing. Uh, so the, we need the daily cleansing that only the word can bring. And folks, I will tell you, like I tell the prospective members, if you're not doing personal Bible study, start. Start. You don't have to do a half hour. You don't have to do an hour. Start. Start in five minutes. Do something. Read the daily bread. And then if, you know, that gives you one uh, verse and a story. And when you're ready to tackle it, it also takes you through the Bible in a year. And if you want to still want to do half the Bible, you can just do the Old Testament part or the New Testament part. But if you are not doing this, do it. Do it now. Um, this washing of the Word is the only washing that the Holy Spirit has Paul give us. Um, 1 Corinthians 1, 14-17 the Corinthians were arguing who baptized them and whose baptism was best. And the Holy Spirit had Paul say this, I am thankful that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. So no one can say that you were baptized into my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Okay, you understanding that, what it's saying? Baptism is a symbol, folks. It's an important symbol. But baptizing doesn't save you. When you come up out of the baptismal, you're not suddenly saved. And, and Paul was baptized. When, when he was Saul, one of the first things that happened was baptized. But, but he realized very shortly that the spirit baptism was what he was supposed to be teaching and bringing people to a point where they would say yes to Jesus, offer his sins or his blood for their sins. And that was what was important. And he says here, with words of human wisdom, you know, if, if I'm just going to stand up here and tell you what I know and think, then I should, I should shut up and sit down. But what I'm trying to do here is look and my, I'm trying to change my life to fit what's being said here. So, we're filled, we get filled with the dirt of the world, and we're washed clean by Christ's guarantees and promises that we find in the Word of God. So what is this spiritual washing for? Verse 27, to present her, now let's keep the, uh, where we are here, we're talking about the guy to present his wife, 
But, but now it changes a little. It says, as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Okay, now we're going to back and forth here just a little bit before we move completely spiritual. All right, the Jewish bride, before her wedding, would have what was a ritual bath. And of course, that was so she was clean. Um, but she also is is presented then as um, a bride that is holy and blameless. Wow. Wow. We, we don't come to the marriage altar that way, do we? But yet we are, if we are a believer. Because we've been declared holy and blameless blameless. We're going to sing that about the church here in a little bit. But you might say, that's well and good, but, but how do I know when I love my wife enough? <laughs> We'd like that answer for a lot of things, won't we? How do I know when I've done enough? How do I know when I'm okay with Jesus? Let me know so I can stop. Why do we want to stop? I mean, we're so worried. Get that test done. You have so much time to get that test done. Now your test is done. Whew! And we have goals. You do this. Do, 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 do. I got it all done. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. But, it, but it's not that way with marriage. Okay? So we're told in 28, in this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Number six. <clears throat> A believer is willing to to sacrifice everything for his bride. That's a humbling statement, guys. I, I'd like to think I sacrifice everything for Nance. I can't tell you until I would actually go through it. I, I say I would, but would I? He makes her well-being of primary importance. Uh, that probably means those six movies Nancy's watching, waiting to watch, I should give up a race and let her watch some. Now that's simple, that's simple. But, but you know, we're talking about her health. Do you, you know, you've probably heard the husbands and wives that they can't afford their medicine. So one of them quits so that the other one can. But we should be willing to do that kind of thing even up to lose our lives. Because, you know, we never know what that's going to look like. Um, but I'm, I don't think I finished that. He cares for her as he cares for his, his own body. And, and we don't know what that's going to look like. Because we, we take these vows, many of us, when we got married, that says in sickness and in health. And many times we put on this other ending till death. Do us part. Hmm. Now this thing in uh, verse 28, this, this part that says, if you love your wife, you're loving yourself, you might think. Well, then that's being selfish. selfish. No, no, li listen up here. Number seven. Guys, as soon as we see we are less than loving to our wives, we're going to notice it. We're going to notice a change. She's not going to be as responsive. What do I mean by that? If I'm treating like Nancy like dirt, I probably shouldn't expect a fresh made apple pie. All right? But when I treat her right, I can expect many loving surprises. I use this in pre-marriage counseling too. I grew up loving to have my feet tickled, loving to have my back scratched, where people would, you know, they'd go crazy getting all ticklish. I loved it. I loved it. And I had three sisters, and I was older than they all were. So I'd lay at the couch, and I'd stick my feet down there. Sister number one would come in there. I'd say, oh, I think you ought to scratch my feet for about an hour. Sister number two, about an hour. Sister number three, about an hour. And then I'd take them to the movies or something now and then, you know, I kind of paid them back, I thought. We got married, I assumed that kind of treatment would continue. And Nancy says, get them stinky old feet off me. 
But you know, I couldn't learn. I couldn't learn. I made her. Now, I, I didn't, I just guilted her into it. If you really love me, you scratch my feet. Something like that. I don't know. I, I can't tell you. But she hated it. And have I paid a price for that? I mean, I'll ask her, can you rub my leg or something and then when we're driving and it's getting, going to sleep or something. And, and uh, she doesn't like to do that anymore. But you know, we've gone some places doing some things that she likes to do. And I've, maybe the seats are full. I've sat down in front of her already, just leaned back on her legs. And I get the nicest back rub. And sometimes she'll just, you know, touch me in a loving way. And later on, I'll say, thank you for doing that. She'll say, for doing what? She don't even know that she did it. Because I'm treating her right. Because we're doing something that she likes to do. All right, verses 29 and 30. After all, no one ever hated their, his own body, but he feeds it and cares for it, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. If I asked this morning how many of you hate your bodies, I'll bet you some hands would go up. <laughs> but do we really? We might say we hate our bodies. I don't like the way I look. Does that stop me from eating? Does that stop me from getting a house to live in? Does that stop me from wearing clothes that look decent? No. And then we're told in verse 31, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Okay, so he's been talking about marriage, and now he's kind of summing up what marriage is. Now, that sounds familiar. It's part of the creation account. And, and uh, it's God's plan for husband and wife to be one. So if we go back to the garden and look in Genesis 2, 23 to 24, it's, it's also where the doctrine of headship begins. So those verses say in Genesis 2, 23, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she will be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall become one flesh. That is the first recorded marriage, folks. Uh, we don't know how many were in each side of the bridal party and, and uh, we don't know if they had a uni, uni candle or if they did sand or... No. <laughs> No, that, that's not what's important about it. Marriage begins when God presents the woman, Eve, to the man as his wife. Then, and only then, do they take on the idea of the two becoming one. And the command to fill the earth. And of course, that is through sexual intimacy. All right, that was approximately 4,000 years ago. No, 6,000. Approximately 6,000 years ago. Now we, we fast forward to 2,000 years ago. Jesus was asked about divorce. And we're not going to look it up, but it was in Matthew 19, 4 to 6. And, and he said, uh, well, you know what? Back in Genesis here, we, the father and I, we had an idea. And we came up with this idea about how the, the groom should leave his home and then be joined with the wife. And have, but you know, that was so old, we have to have a new way. And then, then your Bible, any of your Bibles? No. He, came, he goes right back to that Genesis account and says the same thing. It has never changed through history. It is as valid today as when it was given. So we know the two become one flesh through physical intimacy. Now, when we talk about two becoming one flesh, that doesn't mean that a person loses their personality and uh, through each other. But you will change each other's personality when you get married. But the truth that we're hitting at is number eight, that marriage oneness. Each person cares for the other as though caring for themselves. Okay, 
Now that's one thing, now it goes a little further. Learning to anticipate the other's needs. Helping the other reach their potential. Guys, we, we pay attention. If we see our wife's gonna need to catch up or, or something like that, we get it ahead of time. If we see that, that she's ready for her dessert and the dessert's not on the table, we get it and we put it on, we anticipate those needs. This union merges two persons in a way that little can affect one without affecting the other. If your wife is sad, you shouldn't really be out having a party. Maybe some of her family died, maybe a friend died. No. And, and if you had a lousy day at work and, and maybe you got put on probation or something, your wife does not rejoice about that, but she has compassion. Now here's where the switch is made in 32 from marriage to the church. I hope that I can explain this, if you understand. Uh, so 32 says this is a profound mystery, Tra probably better translated now as a mystery because we didn't understand it yet. Uh, Paul hadn't given this mystery the meaning of this mystery. And again, it wasn't something that God was trying to keep from us, but it wasn't time to give it till right now. So a better translated profound truth. So let's say this is a profound truth that I'm talking about Christ and the church. All right. Marriage ingredients. Let's look at those just a little bit. Mutual love. You know what mutual means? Going both ways. Loyalty. Husband's loving leadership with wife's loving submission. Intimacy. Self-sacrifice. And oneness. Now, God and Jesus here and the Holy Spirit are talking about a marriage, but not a marriage like that we would go to for our cousins or, or someone in our family. This is talking about a future wedding, the wedding of the Lamb of Christ. And, and Christ looks at the, the human marriage and shows what his church and his relationship is going to be in his church. He says, I want you to have that in your marriage. I want you to have that in your marriage. So that you and I honor Christ when we don't give up on each other, when we anticipate the other's needs, when we... Um, help each other out when we want this said that you want the best for the other how many of you know people who have both wanted to go to college a husband and wife but they can't afford it so the wife will say or the husband i'll work for several years get you through college and you can work and get me through college sometimes they don't follow up on that but that that is looking out for the other you think christ is looking out for his church yes. absolutely Absolutely. The Holy Spirit sums up his marriage guidance in this way, verse 33. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. How about those two words, folks? Love and respect. Respect and love. They are a must for the believer's marriage. And can you imagine how many marriages could be made healthy and strong if both husband and wife would fulfill the simple yet thoughtful instructions? The divorce rate would head south as we live out and follow the examples that are given. Number 10. The husband and wife who love and respect each other have a healthy marriage and a great atmosphere to raise a family guys you know where our children will learn to respect their mother by watching how we treat 
their mother. And when you treat mom like she doesn't know what she's doing, she's a little bit goofy, you know what, after a while the kids will start to say that same thing. That is not helpful in any relationship, but for sure in marriage. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for giving us the church and your relationship with the church. And you want a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, washed in the blood of the Lamb. You made it possible. Lord, marriage is still the way you want man and woman to live together. Even though it's approximately 6,000 years old, it's still the way. So help us, Lord. Help us. If there's anyone here this morning that are having some issues with their marriage and you just want to let it that way quiet but you need you'd like your marriage prayed for you can call in and talk to myself or Angie just say I have an unspoken request and we can put that in if there's anyone that needs to talk needs more to, to work on their marriage I'm not uh, a certified counselor but I can certainly listen and, and give some ideas and and refer if if someone needs more than I have to offer and I don't feel bad about that at all if someone goes somewhere else on it. So as we think about that, you know, Lord, it, it all comes down. We're going to act like a Christian husband or a Christian wife if we are a Christian. So finally, if someone has never made the proclamation, Lord, that you are their Lord and Savior, I would help them with that too. Not, I'm, I'm nothing special. I'm just a servant of the Lord trying to, to help people understand Scripture and see what's being asked of us. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, Glorious Church, I guess we've never sung that since I'm here because I had to make up the, uh, the words for it. I mean, the sheets for it. So let's sing it. I hope you know it. Uh, and we don't want any spot and wrinkle. We want her smooth and glorious. Please stand if you are able. It is number 358.
day I'm reminded that I have spots and wrinkles. <laughs> but praise God, it's not because of anything I've done. It's because of what he has done. I know most of you have already been through that process of uh, being washed by the blood of the lamb. If not, please don't leave here today without talking about it. And all of God's people said, Amen.